Welcome to the nimble uh, webinar today that will be focusing on the process intensification program. I'm Allison Howe, the program manager for the process intensification program. And I'll start with some announcements. All right, we would like to let everyone know that you'll be muted throughout the presentation today. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to direct to the panelists, please use the chat feature. Uh, and just a note on confidentiality that this webinar is open to Nimble members and non-members. Please do not post any Nimble confidentiality or proprietary information in the chat or question and answer section. Um, after the completion of the webinar, you will receive a survey link uh, and then completing the survey will allow you immediate access to the webinar recording. Right. Thank you for your attendance today. Okay. Right. Uh, so the process intensification program is led by Dr. John Erickson. He is the son of a NASA engineer. Dr. Erickson has always had a natural curiosity and passion for innovation. Uh, he received a bachelor's in biology and chemistry from Amherst College and a master's in chemical engineering practice and a PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. He initially worked in industrial entomology at Rhone Poulenc before joining the biopharmaceutical industry. After joining GSK, he held a variety of roles in process development, project management, and manufacturing over 29 years. One of the highlights of the time was working with other industry colleagues on the AMAB case study most recently, Dr. Erickson served as Vice President, Biopharmaceutical and Sterols Manufacturing Science and Technology, where he was responsible for scientific oversight and support for commercial biopharmaceutical drug substance and sterile fill finish of biopharmaceuticals and small molecules. Dr. Erickson started a consulting company in 2019. He has been consulting for the National Institute for Innovation and in Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals, a public-private partnership since 2019 as a senior fellow and has been acting chief technology officer since 2020. At Nimble, he applies his perspective and his extensive industry experience to help ensure that Nimble investments are aligned with current industry needs, support the management of a portfolio of impactful projects and help lead technology initiatives and projects that will benefit the biopharmaceutical manufacturing ecosystem. Welcome, John. Thanks a lot, Allison, for that uh, introduction. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about our process intensification program. I'll start with the program strategy. The first thing that uh, I thought was we need to align on a vision about where we want to go. So early on, we said there are a number of things that, that we could do, but uh, for this program, let's focus the scope on monoclonal antibodies and therapeutic proteins. So. We we'll align on a vision and scope. The next step is to uh, develop a technology strategy, which I'll get into uh, next. Then build prioritization and maturation platforms. Uh, by that, uh, I mean, what are some objective ways that we can prioritize the technology that we uh, want to develop? And, and how can we help to mature that technology in an expedited way? Uh, the next step is to deliver early solutions. So we need to get points on the board. We need to uh, deliver uh, results. And then after those platforms have been built, we need to leverage the entire ecosystem using uh, those platforms. So that's the overall uh, program strategy. The first thing then was to align on the vision. And the way that we did that was to start out with a a white paper uh, that a number of us collaborated on email, and then uh, that culminated in a three-day workshop where uh, we had uh, key opinion leaders in R&D and supply chain uh, from 14 major uh, manufacturers and suppliers. We, we met together at the University of Delaware, and we agreed that this is the time where we can have a significant impact on CMC development and manufacturing and, and to look at end-to-end -end integration and technology management. Uh, we also agreed that now is the time 
to collaborate uh, in a consortium. There have been times in the, the life cycle of the, the industry and, and uh, in the therapeutic proteins in particular, where companies have wanted to um, you know, have a more proprietary approach and, and sometimes where there's more collaborative approach. And we thought this is, this is a time where, where people really want to uh, collaborate. Uh, we thought we had the, the right industry leaders to uh, enable success. And everybody uh, left the meeting and says, okay, we're going to go back and advocate for doing this uh, collaboration together uh, in our companies. And we had some high level uh, goals and strategy uh, that was agreed. We had some priorities, but we said, you know, the details have got to be refined really after we get the uh, participants identified. So that's the, the high level vision. And then the next thing that we need to do is to develop the technology strategy that I was talking about. And the way that we did that was as follows. What we said was, all right, if we have continuous change, that's gonna be too disruptive. So let's break things out into three different generations of technology. First generation of uh, technology, and let's see, let me get the laser pointer there. She so should be able to see it, right? First generation technology, this technology has already been demonstrated at scale. Some people may be doing this in commercial uh, production. Some may not, but it, it could be. And so the challenge there is adoption of that technology. And then what do you do with the legacy uh, equipment and the legacy uh, processes? And how do you eventually uh, convert that? So that's first generation. Second generation is technology where it, there's been some kind of proof of concept uh, in a lab. Uh, if you're familiar with our, our BRL, so it's past you know, BRL uh, 3, but it's, it's something that we think could be realized in the next 3 to 5 years. So, so the idea is here to be developed and then adopted after that. And then third generation technology is technology that fulfills the 10 year vision uh, that we set that I'm, I'm going to talk to you about. And that is technology is probably needs to be invented. Uh, you know, not ready to, to start developing um, a lot of it yet, and then you know needs to be uh, adopted for the to fulfill the ten year vision. So our startup strategy then is really focused on these first three years. So first generation adoption, uh, we need to encourage adoption, and and uh, we were doing that with the NMAB uh, case study, and Gene Schaefer gave a, a talk on that uh, last year. So I'm not going to talk more about that. For second generation, we said, let's leverage advances in other industries. And so there, there's likely, for, for the second generation, likely to be minimal changes to the unit of operations. We'll probably still have bioreactors and columns and tanks, but there should be some disruptive change to everything around the, uh, the unit operation. So to the plant and to the equipment, and I'll come on to that. Uh, in a little bit, but, you know, if you looked at a process flow diagram, maybe that's the same, but if you walk into a factory, very different. And then for third generation, that's, that's a lot longer, uh, out. Uh, and we need to build some platforms that we can leverage later on, but just, we need to start now building those platforms. So how do you select the appropriate technologies and how do you leverage the ecosystem? When we talk about the, the ecosystem, we mean. You know, the, the, the large companies, the, the small companies, the, the academics, the, the, the federal government, the, the nonprofits, the whole ecosystem that we have uh, in the U.S. And, and how, how can, we, can we leverage all that and, and make that really work together to get where we want to go? Uh, and then use all of that to encourage relevant novel unit operations. Okay, so what are the biggest problems uh, to solve that when we got together? One of them was inflexible custom plant and equipment. So what that does is that drives low plant utilization. Uh, if you've got low utilization, you've got high depreciation expense. If you've got a new product that, that's off platform, that may require a whole new factory. Uh, or if it's a significant change, it may require some renovations, which would, would mean you got to, you know, it, once you get uh, you know knock down walls, start making dust, you, you know your your production is is down for a long period of time, and the 
the factory while you're you're doing the renovations and then and then you get to come back. So the other thing is there's a, a high cost and a long lead time just for the the custom equipment. All that customization takes time. Um, and so I wanted to talk about a little bit more about why we need flexibility. We need flexibility because the forecast is always wrong. And uh, you know, there I've I've given they've shown this slide to you know people with marketing backgrounds and they laugh and nod their head. Yeah, that's that's true, right? I mean, we we can't tell the future. This is an interesting um, uh, study I, I really like from uh, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery. What they did is they looked at 260 drugs launched between 20, 2002 to 2011, and they compared the forecast. So that what, what they said the forecast was with the actual peak that was was years later on, and 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 these are the results, right? So this is the number of uh, forecasts out of the 260. And this is the, the median error, right? So there's zero to 20% overestimates, overestimates are to the right, underestimates are to the left. And the summary, and they said most forecasts were wrong, often substantially. And you could you could tell it was tipped off a little bit because of the um the title, which is uh, pharmaceutical throwing uh forecast throwing darts question mark. Said most of them were wrong, often substantially. 60% of the forecasts were over or under by more than 40%. So those are the blue bars. The green bars are uh, you know, within 40%. The blue bars are more than 40% off. And 20%, that's this one right here, were overly optimistic by more than 160% the actual peak revenues. And if you look at this graph, what this says is that the accuracy was poor even years after launch, right? So this is two years before launch, you know, 75% difference uh, on the average, you know, between the, uh, the the forecast and the actual peak. But look at this, you know, at the time of launch, still greater than 50%. And even years later, five, six years after launch, significant um, difference between what the forecast says and what the actual was that year. Uh, so, that means you've either got too much or too little manufacturing uh, capacity. So the other thing is there is a bias that we can see here in the from the, the, the marketing group to overestimate the forecast. But there's also a bias with the manufacturing people. There's a bias to not to build too small and lose sales. Uh, because if, if you build a plant that's too big, you're going to have excess capacity and you're going to have more depreciation. But if you build a plant that's too small, you're going to lose sales. Sales cost 10 times the cost of goods. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I like to say if you build a plant that's too big, you might get in trouble. If you build one that's too small, you might get fired. So there's a there's a bias to build plants that are bigger based on forecasts that are overly uh, optimistic. Okay, uh, so that's inflexibility. We uh, we're also slow to respond to change. So if you have a new medicine coming through uh, the pipeline, we want to get that out to patients as soon as possible. And, and uh, sometimes the the plant and the equipment and the text transfer is on the critical path uh, to that. So delayed medicine. Available to, to patients, if it's a life saving medicine, or if it's, I mean, hopefully it's got some kind of a benefit to people. You want to get that as soon as possible. And there are also lost sales, you know, could be a million dollars a day or more, depending on the, on the peak sales. Um, and there's a need to commit to capital before you've got key phase three and sales data, uh, which is a, a big problem because, because you don't know how much to, uh, to commit, wouldn't it be good if you could wait until you knew for sure that you needed certain capacity and then and then build it? I'm going to come on to that in a minute. All right, capital costs, another big problem to solve. If you if you spend a, a billion dollars on a new facility, that's money that's not available for drug development. The high capital costs also leads to long approval times. You usually go to the CEO or the COO, and that further slows the process of uh, of building because it's such a, a major uh, commitment for the company. And then uh, because of the capital cost being so high, utilization is low, 
then uh, you get a high cost of goods. And finally, and I think it's very important for this discussion, the capital cost, a high capital cost is a huge barrier, in my opinion, to change and in innovation because companies build that facility. They want to depreciate it for a long time uh, and, and take advantage of that. But sometimes technology changes uh, faster than the, the you know, 15 to, to 30 years that somebody might want to depreciate a factory. Another big problem, high energy, water, and plastic use. And that makes it difficult uh, to meet uh, sustainability goals. And most companies now have uh, goals about sustainability. And then reliability was the last big problem. It causes waste and rework. Uh, it causes you to have high inventory because uh, people want to make sure that, that you know, we don't lose a sale. So even though there's a very low likelihood that you might not be able to produce when people need it. Nobody wants to take that chance. And so companies in, in, have billions and billions of dollars. Individual companies have billions of dollars uh, in inventory and, and the whole industry uh, obviously has, you know, many uh, tens of billion dollars in inventory and that's cash that could be released to do other things. Um, poor reliability also cut there's a there's a cost to poor quality the cost to investigate this inability to manufacture at the pull of the customer ideally you'd like to be able to do that and and one thing just a very specific example so if you're doing an integrated continuous uh process and you get a contamination and you know you use the, the standard methods you don't find out for five days that's five days of production that's down the drain and then you've also got to uh you got to stop you got to clean then you can't come back into production until you've you've passed the test again. So that that's an enormous amount of uh, waste and uh, and lost time. All right. So what are we going to do about those problems? Um, remember, I talked about first generation and second generation uh, solutions. So we'll start with the second generation solutions: flexible, customizable, off-the-shelf equipment can solve or help to solve of these problems. First of all, the inflexible custom uh, plant and equipment. So we're talking about equipment that could be reconfigured or, or self-customized. Um, if you look at slow response to change, if you have um, a custom piece of equipment, that takes a long time. You've got to do the engineering. Somebody's got to go and make it just for you. But if instead of doing that, you could buy, instead of buying a custom skid, say a custom chromatography skid, you could buy the, the base skid and then the pumps and the, and the sensors and the valves and very rapidly customize it yourself, assemble it yourself. That would, it, that would really speed up uh, that process. And then there's also uh, capital cost. I mentioned that you've got you to build way before you know that you, you actually need it. What the customizable, flexible, off-the-shelf equipment allows you to do is to wait until you know that you need the, uh, the capacity. So you could wait until you're, um, you know, you've got uh, phase three results uh, potentially, or you could wait until you're more confident of, of what your, uh, your forecast looks like. Um, you know, eventually, you know, wouldn't it be great if you're, if you're a plant manager and you're running at full capacity and, and you get a phone call from a uh, sales organization, they say, okay, our uh, forecast is wrong and um, it's going to double. Uh, and you say, no problem. You phone up your suppliers, say, I need another, you know, three more lines. A few weeks later, the equipment arrives on your loading dock. Uh, you know, in a week, it's been uncreated and assembled and, and put into, uh, into place. That could really transform uh, the way that we think about manufacturing. So that's the flexibility. Um, fast automated tech transfer. That helps with the slow response to, uh, to change for the new product introduction, especially if that's on the, the critical path. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But the idea is that you've got two-way visibility between the development people and the, and the plant people about what's coming and, and where it needs to go. Um, and that also helps you with reliability so that you don't have uh, as many mistakes, particularly uh, with new products. Intensified uh, processes, is a, that's a third generation 
uh, solution. But those really help with capital and with sustainability because the intensified processes shrink the um, the, the the footprint of the the, fact, uh, the factory. They shrink the, the the size of all the equipment. Uh, all of the infrastructure gets gets smaller, so so that gets uh, less expensive. But you're also um, producing more product per uh, unit of of energy and and water and uh, and plastic. Sustainability tools um, can also help us with water and plastic use, and I'll come on to that a little bit. But but understanding when we're we're designing processes, how, what the impact on uh, on the energy and water use is going to look like is going to really help with that, and it also helps us with our um, intensified processes. Rapid micro detection uh, is uh, going to help with reliability, and then another third gen solution is under. Sorry, um, process understanding uh, and control can really help with that. Okay, so uh, where are we now then? So we we developed the technology strategy we to build the prioritization and maturation platforms. And so, you know, how do you how do you do, how do you select the the processes or the technologies that you want to work on? That was something that that really bothered me when we were. We're starting out. Everybody's got a different idea about what technologies uh, should look like, and we've got we've got roadmaps about you know how things are going to going to look. But you know when it comes down to specifically which technologies we're going to look at, um, I was struggling with that. And I was thinking, you know, it'd be great if we had some kind of a machine that takes an ins and input. Okay, this is the current state. This is the future state. This is the this is the bioprocess ecosystem. These are all the people that we have. And it spits out relevant, so relevant to the, the the goal that we want to get to. Tested, mature technology out the other end, and data to promote adoption. What's that? What's that look like? So I, I started to think about what what does that machine look like? And it's got a couple elements. First element is how do we know what we're going to work on? And I call that the innovation selection platform. So you look at today's factory. And you look at the processes, the facility, the equipment, and all the systems, the quality systems, the data systems, logistics, and tech transfer. And we model that. We're developing models uh, for that now and come out with some baseline KPIs. And these are the KPIs that, that people really care about. Think about then what is the desired future benefit, which tells us what the future state KPIs need to look like. And then we run the model backwards. Well, I mean, doesn't want to really run backwards. There's an iterative process, but to say, okay, if 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 in order to get to these KPIs, what does the, the the factory need to look like? And we can do that with a second generation factory, or we could do that with you know looking ten years out to a, a third generation factory. And the difference between those two factories is the desired innovation uh, that we need. And then once we know the desired innovation, that comes to the specific innovation projects. So that's the selection engine. And then the next part is the maturation platform. So I want to just think about uh, some lessons from going to the moon. Because they uh, built equipment and they tested it in the simulators, right? So this is a, a picture of the, the lunar landing module. Um, obviously, it's got to land on the moon. But before they did that, they, they built this facility that where they could land it on the Earth um, in, you know, a, a, a nice uh, environment uh, where, you know, if they failed, it wasn't wasn't really a problem, and it had one six gravity. And and the, the the lesson here is that theoretical models only contain what you already know, and the physical equipment generates some real problems to solve. So as much as 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 we like theoretical models, um, we we still need the the uh, the physical tests. And then you fix the unexpected problems, which you don't know until you got in the simulator, and you re reduce the risk in a safe environment. Um, you know, a, a lot of people are reluctant to put a new technology in the commercial factory. But how, how do we know it's going to work? Well, can we have a, a safe uh, environment that where we can test in a relevant environment? And you could also practice to make sure that it works. So. A bioprocess simulator looks like something where you test technology in context with the other things around it. You test it under expected use conditions, and it enables earlier testing than you would normally do. So, 
It's a resource that small companies and universities uh, would have to build, might not be available. Large companies uh, have pilot plants, but maybe they're making uh, clinical trial supplies and they're, they're not uh, available. And, and lastly, I want to say that, that we're looking here for a technology focus, not a vendor uh, focus. It's really looking at future technologies, not comparison of, of today's offerings. So this is the whole innovation and selection and maturation engine. Uh, so this, this is the, that machine that I was telling you about earlier. You start out with the desired future state and the state of the art. You, uh, I just had that slide on the next gen factory that spits out second and third generation technologies that are needed. And then we promote the development of that technology with our ecosystem. So this, this is, this is the ecosystem here. Um, and so, you know, it may be, uh, funding some of this, it may be publishing about what's uh, needed. It may be some, um, collaborative approach, any number of ways, but to promote that development of the technologies. And then when it's ready to test. Develop it for a nimble platform. What's the nimble platform? So I'm going to talk a little more about that, but we have a platform process to make a non proprietary monoclonal antibody. And we've got a, a facility to do that University of Delaware. So we've agreed on that platform. That process can then be run. And then, uh, for where we are right now, you could produce standard feedstocks. And then those could be sent to the lab to, for somebody who's developing that. So, for instance, if you're uh, developing a polishing step, you could get uh, protein A purified uh, material and you know, that's your feedstock or whatever the relevant feedstock is. So you develop it first in your own lab. Then when you're ready to come and, uh, and use the test bed, we've, we've got the standard process that's been running. We, we've measured the baseline. We incorporate your change into our test bed. We test the change, we measure the results, and then we compare the results to the baseline and we evaluate it. Maybe, you know, it looked like a good idea, but the, the results show that this is just not going to work. And so we stop. Maybe, you know, it looks pretty good, but uh, we've got some ideas about how to improve it. So we can go through this, uh, this improvement loop. You could go through that a, a couple of times. And, and then either stop or you might say, wow, this is really good. We want to incorporate this technology, this innovation into the standard platform now. So now we incorporate the standard platform and then next time we run the standard process, it includes that innovation. So we've just raised the bar for, uh, for all the new uh, technologies that come out. And then the outputs are the updated platform that we tell everybody about, which then goes to the the state of the art now has gone up. Technologies that are de-risked in context and data that's relevant to uh, adoption. So uh, we're just going to think a little bit about when the, the best time to do that is. So if you if you do that on a critical path of a late phase compound, um, it, it, that's a train that you really don't want to get in the way of. And uh, a lot of people were concerned about doing that because if you delay you're going to uh, you know, delay the launch. So that's usually not a uh, good idea. You could develop it on the critical path for an early compound. There, there's not much at stake. Um, but the reason that there's not much at stake, at stake is because there's a 90% chance that that candidate's going to fail. And if that candidate fails, then you know, all the work that you've done might uh, go along with it. You can, you can look at second generation commercial processes. There's, there's no risk of drug failure because it's already commercial, but they're, they're pretty high stakes here. And the regulatory changes and their their uh, plant downtime uh, challenges. So what I want to propose is, what if we look at off critical path model compound? There's no risk of failure. It's a model compound. Lots of people can use it, um, but it's not something that a lot of people do because of the opportunity cost for process development. But we can mitigate that if we say we're going to leverage the effort of the collaboration. And we're going to test early in the uh, in context. Um, I mentioned we've got a standard platform. There's a standard molecule, uh, so it's a Cho based uh, NIST map. There's a standard cell line. We've got analytical methods, data format, and uh, a process, which I'll show here. It's a you know, kind of a 
standard consensus process is very similar to the process that we use for uh, AMAB. And as an example, say we were testing out a new sensor and a new feed and control strategy, the test bed, uh, and we like it. So we incorporate that into the platform. And now, you know, if we look at a, some kind of a non chromatographic capture step, that's in the context of this new uh, strategy. And, you know, maybe we look at a new host and we don't need a bunch of uh, polishing steps and we can do the experiment to see holistically uh, how does that look. And I mentioned the standard feedstocks. I think that's really important. That amplifies the value of what we're doing throughout the ecosystem because we can send that um, around the country. And there's a safe place to uh, collate it in a co located, I should say, in a non competitor space. And I like this um, chart here. So this is the test bed. You can have uh, small companies, say, sending in a prototype to send people. Big companies could send people, feedstocks could come into the company, they could, could test them uh, there. You might have a university that's sending a prototype, getting feedstocks. You might send samples to a government agency, they might send, send people. But it all revolves around this uh, test bed for the uh, collaboration hub. So we've, we've built the, um, the platform, major equipment's been uh, de delivered, uh, installation uh, is ongoing. And, uh, you know, we're at the point now where we're about ready to get the automation system installed and do the shakedown runs. And it's supposed to be, uh, we think, uh, operational second half of this year. And then, you know, we'll publish the results when they're available. Okay, so that's the maturation platforms. The next step is to deliver early uh, solutions, those second generation um, solutions. And I want to just go through a few of them. So flexibility, uh, we, we, what we're doing is to have interchangeability so alternatives can be used without custom fitting. Um, customization and reconfiguration. Uh, and you sort of customization, you think about that from the vendor point of view, reconfiguration, you think about it from the, the, the user point of view. But you can add or remove or reorder components yourself adjustable production rate, automated equipment qualifications, you've got autonomous diagnostic tests. But basically what this is, is, is when, when you put new equipment in or you change new equipment, you have people with clipboards and, and protocols that are going around and make sure that it's fit for purpose. So what this is doing is exactly the same thing, except the clipboards are, are running around electronically to make sure that the, and, and very, very uh, quickly. So, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, in, in minutes, making sure that this thing is fit for purpose and portability. So you can move the system from one place to another without rework. So how are we doing that? First is uh, to develop voluntary industry standards for software and hardware. And all of these things, uh, we're looking at vendor agnostic solutions so that any component following the standard should be able to, uh, to play. It doesn't mean that all the vendors have to do things the same way. They can compete in a, in a number of varieties, but the idea is, can we all come together on this standard that allows this to, uh, to happen? Um, then do demonstrations of proof of concept at member companies in our, in our nimble test bed. And then finally to showcase uh, those to, to really push out the, 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 the benefits of that demonstration and to drive adoption by uh, vendors and users. So that's the, the flexibility that, that I talked about. That's one of those second gen solutions. Uh, the next one was the fast automated tech transfer. And the strategy here is to develop some cross country st cross uh, company standards. So business processes and reports, uh, production process and plant information flow. It can flow in both uh, directions so that the plant can see what's coming so that the, um, the people doing the development see if what they're developing is gonna fit and, and, and can react uh, in real time. Um, the idea is to let vendors compete on software that to implement this. So we're not gonna do the, the, imp the software implementation uh, and the other thing is that uh, we, we realize you know, companies have various data infrastructures. Uh, and so, you know, one size probably doesn't fit all. And this is a, a great way to, you know, to let the, the ecosystem go and, and solve that problem. So deliverables then, you know, standard reports, 
generic tick transfer reports, ontologies, that's how things, how those parameters relate to each other so you can talk about them, and standards to enable the software development, but not the software itself. Sustainability, uh, I mentioned. So there's a 10 year vision uh, for that, which is carbon neutral bioprocessing. But you know, I'll just read that the goal here is that sustainability is a key design criterion for intensified processes and facilities alongside cost yield robustness and quality and can be assessed by a toolbox of widely adopted decision tools. And so the, the, the idea is, you know, the first step, first phase, I should say, is to assess the intensified process sustainability, identify new approaches, innovate on new approaches and implement them. And we're coming to the end of this, uh, this first phase here. We have uh, developed life cycle analysis and, and also uh, biosol, so the you know, more traditional um, uh, process uh, modeling of a nimble process platform compared to uh, FedBatch and, and some uh, talks have been given and uh, posters at conferences about that. Uh, and then we've also developed uh, an LCA model and biosol model uh, with data that's available to our um, our members. Um, and then I mentioned rapid micro. So the idea here is to identify some rapid in-process microbial monitoring that could be done during integrating continuous manufacturing. Could be other places too, but it seems like the need is, is, is high there. And then demonstrate the feasibility as a part of a microbial control strategy and provide confirmation of microbial control demonstrate that in a representative environment, and then regulatory advocacy for the implementation uh, of that. So we've written the business case, we've evaluated two technologies, we've, evaluated, we've developed the control strategy, and we've got a, a couple of publications that are uh, forthcoming on that, so I don't want to steal their thunder. And uh, lastly, uh, when we've got the platforms built, uh, which should be you know, the end of the year, then you know, I think we can really leverage the ecosystem with the platforms that we have built. Uh, I would like to acknowledge there are a host of people, there's a cast of thousands really who've been involved in this, but um, wanted to acknowledge in particular the Workstream leads past and present, they're, they're listed here. These people really did uh, yeoman's work uh, starting from, from scratch to get uh, the, uh, the, the work streams going, figuring out you know, how are we going to um, how we're going to organize, you know, where where do we start? Uh, and so, thank you. Uh, none of this would have been done uh, without you. Uh, and then also wanted to uh, give a shout out to our, our project manager. So you met Allison, uh, who is the uh, one of the the project managers. Uh, Matt Russell and Melissa Hall are also uh, project managers. Matt is on the. Uh, Flexibility and Melissa on the, the steering, uh, sorry, on the uh, test bed. And then, you know, we've got a, a great steering team uh, and uh, other team members. So, with that, I would like to uh, see if you have any questions. And Allison is going to uh, moderate the QA. <laughs> yes. So, I would just like to remind you at this time to any questions that you have. Please enter them in the chat box directed to all panelists. All right. Let's see. So our, our first question, um, I believe, came in while you were discussing the test bed. Uh, so for the nimble model, why not use a real MAB uh, biosimilar? Yeah, uh, uh, that's an interesting, interesting question. question. Uh, uh, the reason we picked the, the NISMAP is, oh, let's see, could somebody, somebody mute? I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Um, the reason we picked the, the NISMAP is because it's been extensively um, studied. There are, uh, there, there are methods that are available that are, that are publicly available, uh, and it's, it's non-proprietary. It's an interesting thought. I need to, to think about it a little bit. Um, not sure what the companies that the biosimilar is competing with would would think about that. The, the nice thing about the NISMAB is it's just kind of it doesn't have any baggage. But uh, interesting question. Have to think about that a little bit. 
Great. Um, so I've had three very similar questions come in. Uh, could you please talk about the participation model uh, a bit and how someone within um, Nimble or someone interested in Nimble could contribute to the different aspects of this program um, beyond, you know, connecting with our Nimble membership team? Sure. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in joining Nimble, uh, you can contract, contact uh, Chris Yoakum. Uh, and I think his uh, information is available on our uh, website. And um, the, as, as far as the, um, you know, I, I think you're talking about, you know, how, how do I get involved in this? I talked about leveraging the, uh, the ecosystem. So right now uh, we've been building a lot of the uh, the platforms and particularly the the test bed. Once the the test bed is is available, uh, I think we were going to have some uh, some calls that will go out to uh, our members for specific things uh, that we're uh, looking for. That's one of the things that we need to uh, to figure out the, the uh, kind of the administrative um, process for that. And could you elaborate on the current participants? And in, in that model, who are the current participants? Yep. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's mostly uh, the uh, large companies uh, at this point. The large companies are uh, are part of the the steering team, and they are you know helping us to to further refine uh, the vision and say you know, where do we want to get to uh, on this. Um, we have reached out to some uh, consultants with specialized uh, expertise, I would say. And then, um, yeah, well, I'll just I'll stop there. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay. So um, look at, looking at the workforce side of things, are uh, there any, Students involved with operating the nimble test bed or plans to be involved in that operation. Um, and, and how would the test bed possibly used. For, um, uh, a workforce and in. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so it, it's something that we have, uh, talked about there. There's there really, I wouldn't say plans, uh. How to do that because you know we've been focused on on getting it up and running. <clears throat> I would say the earliest that you know we'd probably have students in there would would be uh, probably next year. Um, but uh, but it is uh, it's possible. We have uh, staff uh, who we've hired from Nimble to to do the the day to day running of the test bed, and um, you know I did mention uh, earlier on with with the picture of the building. That I think it's a great place to come and collaborate. Uh, and long term, I would love to have what we call industrial fellows uh, working alongside uh, academic fellows in the uh, you know in the the test bed. So it's not just you know somebody learning about how does the equipment go, but we've also got people there from uh, you know, from from companies from academia. And they can share their uh, their knowledge as well. Anything else? Um, could you expand upon how the program is identifying the second generation technologies for development and adoption? Yeah, well, I think the, the ones that I listed are the those are the ones that we're uh, focused on. Um, for right now, because we've only got three to five years, so that's that's really the focus there. Um, and then the, the the next gen factory and some of the other things we're doing are going to um, you know help us know where to focus on things like the intensified processes and the uh, the more robust control. Okay, I think we have just one more question. Uh, what has been the largest challenge for the process intensification program since its inception? Oh, um, I 
I don't know what largest challenge. I know the, the, the what, what immediately came to mind was was kind of the opposite. The 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 the, the greatest joy was working all the people. I mean, people have have been you know absolutely wonderful to uh, to work with. Um, I guess a challenge would be, um, yeah. Wh wh where do we focus? Is there's, there's so much exciting stuff that we could do, um, but there's not time to do all of it. So, so where do we really focus to get the most, uh, you know, for the the resource that that people have to put into it? Yeah. So I I would say uh, focus, and that's one thing that we we've, we've been talking a lot uh, even recently about how can we focus more. Okay. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, that is all. That's all the questions that I have for today. Um, so we just have a few announcements. Well, Allison, I think you went on mute. Right. Thank you, John. Um, so we just have a few announcements before we conclude today. I would like to let everyone know that you can follow uh, the nimble projects and activities on our website uh, and to be sent a weekly email or as updates are um, completed within the website. Uh, after you hit the follow button, you will send be sent one email and that email will contain links to all the updates for any projects that you follow within Nimble. You will not be sent one email per project. So do not worry, we will not be flooding your email box. Um, right. Next slide, John. All right. And we would also like to highlight that we have an upcoming big data program workshop in mid March. Uh, the focus of this workshop will be to collaboratively identify future areas of focus for the nimble big data program. Um, and this is open to members and not members for the 1st day and members only on day 2. Okay. Next slide, John. All right, and so in closing, I would like to remind you that uh, shortly after this webinar ends, you'll be sent a survey link um, telling us how we did and um, what else you would like to see from Nimble. Uh, please complete the survey for immediate access to the webinar recording. And this is the first webinar in our most recent series of Nimble led program webinars. Uh, Big data will be discussing uh, two topics over the next two weeks. And then the beginning of March will be uh, a webinar focusing on the Nimble Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. And you can register at uh, nimble.org. Right. I think that's next slide. All right. And thank you all for your attendance today. Yeah, thanks everybody. Now it's part of the technology strategy. So